So in today's video, I'll be showing you how to install a limited slip differential, more specifically a Quave ATB differential into a manual gearbox. Now this will be a very detailed video where I'll be showing you the process step by step and since we're opening up the transmission anyway, we'll also be rebuilding the transmission along the way, so I'll be showing you that as well. Now this video has been brought to you by Midship Garage, who is also sponsoring this and other videos in this series which will be exploring limited slip differentials. Now Midship Garage is a grassroots business that supplies all sorts of parts for all generations of the Toyota MR2, Toyota Celica and more. They stand out from the rest not only because they do R&D and offer completely unique parts, but also because they're capable of sourcing rare or hard to find parts. Midship Garage is a business led by car enthusiasts for car enthusiasts. As an MR2 owner, I have purchased stuff through Mitchup Garage in the past and I can honestly say that the customer service is top notch and genuinely knowledgeable when it comes to cars. The Quave ATB differential you will see in this video has been supplied by Mitchup Garage and you can find the links to this differential as well as other cool products from Mitchup Garage in the description and the pinned comment down below. Now let's get started. I'll be showing you the LSD install and transmission overhaul process on a Toyota E51 transmission, but the process is very similar for all other front wheel drive or mid-engined manual transmissions. Obviously to install an LSD into this type of transmission you will need to get the gearbox out of the car. In the case of my MR2 the easiest way to get the gearbox out is to get it out together with the engine. This means that the optimal time for doing LSD installs is when you're doing transmission and or engine rebuilds as you'll be killing two birds with one stone like this. Once the transmission is out, the first thing I usually do is to clean it. Transmissions often have years of dirt, grease and other contaminants on them and you want them cleaned away before doing any work on the transmission because if you don't clean them you'll get everything else dirty and just spread the dirt around. For getting the stubborn stuff off, I also like to do a bit of DIY soda blasting. It helps, but it definitely won't get rust or oxidation off. The upside is that it's safe, water soluble, easily washable and it will not harm your parts like other more aggressive blasts media. Here's a bit of before and after the initial cleaning. Once clean it's time to get transmission onto a working surface and drain any oil from it. We're going to start by popping out the axle stubs. Next we remove the clutch fork and start taking the transmission apart. First we remove the three bolts inside the bell housing. After that we move the gear selector levers. And then the gear selector shaft itself. Next we're going to remove the plugs for the bolt detents that hold the shift fork shafts in place. Here you can see them on the parts diagram of the E51 transmission. If you're interested in the parts diagrams, links are in the description. These plugs are usually stuck in there pretty tight and it's easy to strip them, so definitely take necessary precautions when removing them. Once you remove the plug inside you'll find a ball, a sleeve and a spring. Don't lose these. Next we unbolt and remove the top cover. Then we remove the snap ring on top of the input shaft. And after that the shift fork together with the fifth gear sleeve. Next we need to remove this hub that sits on top of the fifth gear synchro on the input shaft. Here it is on the parts diagram. As you can see there's no place for a conventional gear puller to grab onto so using claw type gear pullers on this hub won't work. Instead you need a bolt based gear puller like this one. These are often used to remove crankshaft pulleys but work great in this case as well because the hub we need to remove already has three threaded holes in it that confirm it's made for a puller like this one. The puller works just like a claw type puller. Install the bolts into the threaded holes on the hub, 
make sure the power is flat and then install and turn the large bolt in the middle until the hub starts coming out. In our case, the hub was really tight, so it was a two person job. On the other hand, the fifth gear on the output shaft has a nice big lip on it, so after a bit of heat, a regular claw type gear pour gets it off with relative ease. Next, it's time to remove this retainer plate. Unfortunately, as you can tell by the excess amounts of sealant, somebody was inside this transmission before and they did a number on some of the bolts holding this retainer plate. But in scenarios like these, top-notch professional tools make all the difference. And this Italian-made beta socket made short work of the damaged bolts. Now we're going to remove the three snap rings that hold the shift fork shafts in place. After that, we'll unbolt the middle casing. And lift it off from the rest of the gearbox. As you can see, the amount of excess sealant inside this transmission borders on the ridiculous. Now the output shaft. The differential. and the shift forks together with the input shaft can easily come out. This means that now it's a good time to inspect everything and see which replacement parts need to be ordered. After inspecting everything, it turns out that the transmission was rebuilt relatively recently and most of the critical parts were in really good condition. Here in this photo are all the new parts that I had to order. A full gasket kit, output shaft bearing, fourth gear synchro. I bought an extra as it's inexpensive. I also wanted to replace the fifth gear synchro, but it's no longer available anywhere. So instead I bought a fifth gear sleeve to reduce wear related issues. This little plastic part is the oil squirter that goes underneath the output shaft bearing. I had to buy this because to remove the old one, you usually need to destroy it. Before actually installing the new parts, it's a good idea to use the opportunity to clean the outside and especially the inside of transmission casings, as there's often a lot of sludge, old gasket material and possibly other debris inside. Here you can also observe the oil pump, strainer and oil feed line of the E51 transmission. Here's the entire oil feeding system parts diagram. This is not something you often see inside manual transmissions and this constant and directed supply of oil to all the key parts inside the E51 transmission together with the large and chunky gears ensures longevity and reliability and is one of the key reasons why these transmissions are so robust and can take two to three times more torque than what the engines they were originally made to produced in stock for. Once everything is clean, we start by removing the old output shaft bearing. Here you're seeing an unorthodox technique for removing the bearing shell inside the casing. I'm sure some of you will be tempted to call this butchery and suggest the purchase of dedicated tools. I definitely couldn't do this myself and don't recommend anyone trying this technique unless they're absolutely sure of what they're doing. But the reality is that practice and experience will beat tools in certain scenarios. I have watched this man rebuild dozens of transmissions, anything from three-cylinder Volkswagens to vintage Ferrari and Alfa Romeo to Mazda, Hyundai, Toyota and many others. Throughout his career he has rebuilt hundreds of transmissions and although he owns a very wide array of dedicated tools, time has shown this to be the fastest and safest method. And as you can see, there is zero damage to the transmission casing. Here you can see how the old bearing shell has lost its shine. The non-shiny parts have lost their surface hardness and this bearing is no longer usable. Here is the new plastic oil squirter. And after that, the new bearing shell gets gently hammered in. 
If you listen carefully, you can hear how the sound changes when the bearing shell gets fully seated. The other part of the bearing must be installed on the output shaft. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no space for a gear puller to grab onto, so the bearing must be removed with an angle grinder. But with care and patience, that too can be done with minimal damage. The surface damage of the output shaft is inconsequential as the bearing shell is pressed onto the output shaft and there is no movement between the two. Next, it's time to install the Quave LSD. Here you can see the Quave LSD side by side with the stock open differential. We're going to transfer both of the differential bearings and the ring gear from the stock differential to the Quave. The blue plastic gear drives the speedometer and can also be transferred onto the Quave where it's secured by this large circle. However, I won't be using the flimsy factory cable driven speedometer anymore and will instead be relying on GPS based speed using my AEM GPS module and CD7 digital dashboard, which means I won't be transferring the blue plastic gear onto my Quave LSD. First, we remove both of the differential bearings. And then we unbolt the ring gear. And finally, gently hammer it off the stock differential. Next, the ring gear bolts get thoroughly cleaned in gasoline. The differential bearings get pressed onto the LSD. The ring gear gets gently hammered on. The ring gear bolts get a dab of Loctite and then get bolted down using the weakest setting on the impact wrench. The final step is to torque them down to 123 newton meters or 91 pound feet of torque. Next, it's time to replace the synchro. I'll only be replacing the fourth gear synchro as it seems that someone replaced all the lower gear synchros together with the differential bearings during the last rebuild. Obviously, to get to the synchro, we need to remove some bearings and gears from the shaft. Here you can see the difference between a worn synchro whose conical part is worn to the extent that it allows the synchro to press up flat against the gear. In contrast to this, the brand new synchro has ample space between it and the gear. Now the new synchro gets installed, as well as the gear, and finally the shaft bearing gets hammered back onto the shaft. Here you can see the oil pump gear being installed and as you can see it's driven directly by the ring gear. Next, both the shafts and the forks are assembled and installed together in one go. After that, we reinstall the reverse gear. And then set all the fork shafts in the correct position to receive the gear selector. Next, we reinstall the ball detents. and then the tube for the oil feed system. After that, it's time to oil things up a bit and reseal the casings using reasonable amounts of sealant.
after bolting down the casing, we reinstall the retainer plate and the fork shaft snap rings. Next come all the gears. Followed by the output shaft nut and the fifth gear sleeve and fork. After this, we can finally reseal the top cover again, of course, using non ridiculous amounts of sealant. Next, we install new axle seals. And reinstall the gear selector shaft. The three bolts from inside the bell housing also return home. We finish things off by reinstalling the gear selector levers and verifying that the gear selection works as it should. And there you have it, one transmission rebuilt and equipped with an LSD. Hope you enjoyed that and I hope you find it useful if you decide to undertake a project like this yourself. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.